record now. So we record our meetings. And I want to give a very big, warm Cambridge Homeschool online welcome to Harry Baker, who I think will speak for himself. He's very unique, wonderful entertainer, and I hope you feel inspired by his writing and his poetry and his stories. So a big clap for Harry. Thank you. And we can start. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Harry and I am a poet and I would love to share some of my poems with you and talk a bit about the journey that they have taken me on. And I got into writing through a love of language. When I was a teenager, I used to love listening to music and it was always the lyrics that jumped out at me. And I also used to do a paper round before school, which meant before anyone else was awake, I'd be up on my bike thinking about words. And I once had the revelation that the word bumble rhymed with lots of other things. So in my head, I started making a poem slash rap about a bumbly, mumbly, jumbly, crumbly, stumbly, fumbly bee. And I was so excited by this, I went home and I made a status about it saying, I'm getting a buzz writing about bees because I am hilarious. And my friend Sam, who is equally hilarious, commented underneath saying, oh honey, that's so sweet. And so what happened next was a sort of weird bee themed pun off to me and my friends where I said I apologize for this next one. He said, no worries, hive five. And they just got worse and worse very quickly. But this meant I ended up on the Wikipedia page for bumblebees trying to find new obscure terminology that I could turn into puns to impress my friends. When I was on the Wikipedia page for bumblebees, I discovered two things. The first thing I discovered was that I needed to get a life. The second thing that I discovered was that scientists once proved or thought they could prove that bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly in the first place. By the methods they understood at the time, they said their wings are too small and their body mass is too big. So according to science, it's impossible. You can't do it. You're too heavy. But obviously bees can fly. So I love this story about this tiny little insect doing its own thing, sticking it to the man. Forget the haters. Believe in yourself, especially if you're a fat bee. And I wanted to apply this to my life. And so this is what I wrote. You see, the scientist said the bumblebee couldn't fly. She lacks the wing beats per minute or the necessary size. The bumblebee in her ignorance proved him wrong. She knew that she could fly because she'd flown all along and never imagine. If she listened to that man, she might have stopped. Given up on the spot, tucked her wings in and dropped. So don't ever let someone tell you what you can't do. Because just because it's proven doesn't mean it's true. The bumblebee bumbled. Loving her life, she hums as she flies. The bumblebee fumbled, clumsily stumbled from flower to flower. The bumblebee tumbled, tore through the sky, pulling corkscrews and dyes, and then the bumblebee mumbled, crumbled in front of the queen and her power. The bumblebee grumbled and didn't think explicit, discovered she'd been labelled a gimmick, and then the bumblebee mumbled, desperate to eat that nectar so sweet. The bumblebee humbled her critics, silenced all things scientific, and then zzzzp, the bumblebee jumbled her speech. She did not care because in the air she was free because she was a busy bee. Loved to fly to flowers and visit trees, deliver seeds efficiently, more so than in a breeze, intricate, intimate, meticulous auxiliary, and gather more honey than any sick MC. You see, ever since she learned to fly, she'd earned her stripes. Despite the words of hype from learned types, suppressed the urge to fight or turn in hunch of a sky and but up high, her confidence was soaring. She saw scientists as boring, the sort of people she should be ignoring because they made no sense. At least no scent as sweet as pollen, even centimeters from it, they depended on their drawings. They'd rather follow their charts than follow their hearts. If they saw a bee leave, they still believed the grass, they preferred facts and figures to bees wax and figure, but she begged a different, she flew past and laughed. Now meet the scientists. His aim in life was to try and dismiss any hypothesis he deemed preposterous. When asked why he didn't swallow his pride, he replied that it's obvious would have fit down my esophagus. And his foolproof was foolproof, except for the truth. If the bumblebee had read his report, she'd have agreed she was too heavy, therefore should never be airborne. But ignorance is bliss. And that begins with the bee. So this one is for the bees in the hives living lives of aviation. 
the ones who survive and help survive through pollination, the ones that thrive in those sticky situations with the flocky knocky knee hilly pillification. They are doing what they're doing for the buzz, not for love or money, moving and maneuvering above. If the weather's sunny, proving to the humans their conclusions are confusing and unusually refusing to budge. This is for those who are being themselves and who believe in themselves. You see the bee in themselves and set it free in themselves. You know that even though it's difficult, life is full of miracles and true happiness that became from being cynical, the bumblebee. Forever looking for something sweet, overcoming tumbleweed, but holding on to some belief in summary. This is for those that stay summary and there will be bees to come. What if it comes to be? Because the scientist said the bumblebee couldn't fly. She let the wing beats per minute or the necessary size, but the bumblebee in her ignorance proved them wrong. She knew that she could fly because she'd flown all along. And I would imagine if she listened to that man, she might have stopped. Given up on the spot, tucked her wings in and dropped. So don't ever let someone tell you what you can't do. Because just because it's proven, it doesn't mean it's true. Thank you so much. Oh, so lovely. Um, as I started writing more, I started looking for places where I could share my poems. And this is where I discovered these events called poetry slams. And a poetry slam was a way of turning a poetry night into a competition to make it more exciting for the audience. And what happened was people took it in turns to read poems they'd written themselves. And then five people in the crowd would be given a scorecard out of 10 that they would hold up and vote for their favourite. And if you got the highest score, you could go through to the next round and call yourself a slam champion and pretend you were some kind of wrestler. Uh, and I grew up in London and I became the London slam champion, which meant I was invited to go along to the UK national slam championship. And on the night, I got the highest score for my poems. So I became the UK slam champion. I was invited to go along to the Poetry World Cup, which I had never heard of, but it sounded very exciting. Uh, and it took place in Paris, in France, and it was incredible because there were 20 different poets from 20 different countries all over the world going head to head in their own native languages, ready to be judged by five random French people in the audience. And I think if poetry is hard to judge at the best of times, when you've got me talking about bumblebees, going up against an Estonian freestyle rapper, going up against an older Italian poet who's reading from a music stand, we all secretly hope he's going to break out and start singing opera at the end of it, going up against the Chinese poet in a three minute poetry slam, read one haiku, left the stage after 10 seconds, people were crying, they weren't even sure why, going up against my favourite, which was the Russian poet, who in a three minute poetry slam did a seven minute poem about how aliens are taking over the world through mobile phones it was incredible she was disqualified very hard to judge however i managed to get through to the final and in the final i managed to get the most points for this next poem so what i'm trying to say is that technically speaking this poem is the best poem in the world according to five random french people but they are my favorite french people i hope you like the poem it's called paper people and it goes like this I like people. I'd like some paper people. They'd be purple paper people. Maybe pop up purple paper people. Proper pop up purple paper people. How do you prop up proper pop up purple paper people? I hear you cry. Well, I. I probably prop up proper pop up purple paper people with the proper pop up purple people paper clip. But I pre-prepare appropriate adhesives as alternatives, a cheeky backup pictures in case the paper slipped, because I could put a pop up metropolis. But I wouldn't want to deal with all those paper people politics, paper politicians with their paper thin policies, broken promises that appropriate apologies. There'd be a little paper me and a little paper you. And we could watch paper TV and it would all be pay-per-view. We'd see those poppy paper wrappers wrap about the paper package. We'd watch paper people carry to get stuck in paper traffic on the A4 paper. There'd be a paper princess Kate, but we'd all stare at paper Pippa. We'd all live in fear of Killer Jack the paper ripper because the paper propaganda propagates the people's prejudices. Papers pitting in pictures of the photogenic terrorist that is a little paper me and a little paper you. And in a pop up population, people's problems pop up too. There'd be that pompous paper parliament who remained out of touch, 
who ignored the people's protests about all this paper cuts in their nose. Peaceful paper protests would get blown to paper pieces by those confetti cannons by the prince of police. And yes, there'd still be paper money. So there'd still be paper greed. And those paper piggy bankers pocketing more than they need, purchasing the paper reed to pepper the paper properties. Others live in poverty and aren't acknowledged properly. A proper poor economy where so many are proper poor. But while those needs get ignored, the money goes to big wars. Origami armies on for plans of paper planes while we remain in prison by our own paper chains. And the greater shame is that it always seems to stay the same. What changes is who's in power, choosing how to lay the blame, they're naming names, forgetting these are names of people. So in the end, it all comes down to people. I like people. Because even when the situation is dire, it is only ever people who are able to inspire and on paper. It's hard to see how we all cope. But in the bottom of Pandora's box, there's still hope, and I still hope because I believe in people. People like my grandparents. I mean, every single day since I was born, I've taken time off their morning to pray for me. That's 8,396 days straight, so someone checking I'm okay, and that's amazing. People like my aunt who puts on plays with prisoners. People who are capable of genuine forgiveness. People go out of their way to make your life better and expect nothing in return. You see, people have potential to be powerful. Just because the people in power tend to pretend to be able to come to that system and a paper population is not different. So there's a little paper me and a little paper you. And we could watch paper TV and it would all be paper view. And in a pop up population, people's problems pop up too. Even if the whole world fell apart, then we'd still make it through. Because we're people. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is a number in that poem, which is 8,396. And that's because as I was writing it, my mum told me that her parents, my grandparents, have been praying for me every single day since I was born. And I thought it was such an incredible thing to discover that used to change that number each time I performed the poem based on how many days old I was, because that was the number of times I knew that they had been thinking about me in that way. And then when I was 8,396 days old, my grandpa died. So I paused on that number as a reference to him, but that has meant that in the back of my mind, I've always been roughly aware of how old I am, specifically in days, which meant I was always aware that on the 5th of August, 2019, I was going to turn 10,000 days old, which I think is a birthday we don't celebrate enough. And my way of celebrating was taking a show up to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, the biggest arts festival in the world, called I Am 10,000, all around poetry and maths. Because even though I'm a full time poet, even though I love poems, I love playing around with words and seeing what's possible with language, I also really like maths. And when I finished school, I studied maths at university and I told myself for a long time that poetry and maths were two completely different things. I liked maths because of the definite right answers. It's very satisfying when you could solve equations and problems. And I like poetry because of the freedom and the creativity that came with it. But even though I told myself for a long time that the two are very separate things, I realized the whole reason I got into writing in the first place was because of maths. My school had a Battle of the Bands competition and most of my friends would do covers of their favourite songs from the charts. But me and my friend Luke were the two nerdy math kids. So we thought it'd be a good idea. We rewrote the lyrics to our favourite song and changed them to be, I've got 99 problems, but math ain't one. Complete with an 81 digit pie solo, a choreographed dance routine, and a surprise costume change at the end. We removed our school lab coats to reveal we'd spray painted 99 on the back of our PE kit. And we won an award for most potential. And that award did not exist when we begun our performance. However, something about that stuck with me. And I loved trying to entertain my friends, trying to play around with words. And so I wanted to try again. And I went along to a poetry open mic night for the first time. And I was amazed at what I saw. I think in my head, I had a very specific idea of what I thought poetry had to be. Uh, but there were people from all different backgrounds, all different styles. The one thing they had in common so they wanted to share part of themselves with a room full of people and there was a room full of people who wanted to hear that and it was such an amazing atmosphere i wanted to get involved the only slight issue was i didn't have any poems so i thought 
maybe I could do my maths rap without any music, call it a poem and see how it goes. And so that is what I did. I performed my 99 Problems maths rap without any music, without my friend Luke there, without any costume changes. It was also without any applause at the end or general atmosphere in the room. However, thankfully, there was one person there who saw my performance, who thought it stood out from everyone else's, who came up to me at the end and said, Harry, you seem like a nerd. I am running a poetry night where the theme is going to be prime numbers. We are going to get 25 poets to write poems about the first 25 prime numbers. If you'd like to get involved, just pick your favourite prime number between 2 and 97. Everyone's got a favourite. And then perform that alongside 24 other poems about prime numbers in ascending order. Does that sound like a fun night out for a teenager in London? And I said, where do I sign up? That sounds incredible. And most of these other poems were kind of like rhyming statistics uh but for me even at that point i really liked prime numbers because they were the ones that didn't quite fit in they didn't quite follow the patterns we expected and that to me felt exciting so i wanted to try and tell more of a story with them uh so this is that story and it's simply called 59. 59 wakes up on the wrong side of the bed realizes all his hair is on one side of his head takes just under a minute. To work out that that is because of the way that he slept, he finds some clothes and gets dressed. Now he can help but look in the mirror and be subtly impressed that he looks rough around the edges and yet casually messed as he glances out the window, sees the sight that he is blessed with of 60 from across the street. Now 60 was beautiful. Perfectly trimmed cuticles, dressed in something suitable and never rude or crude at all. Unimprovable, right on time as usual, more onky than a snooker ball, but like to play it super cool. And 59 wanted to tell her that he knew her favourite flower. He thought of her every second, every minute, every hour, but he knew it would not work. He would never get the girl because the lodge of the cross the street that came from different ones of 59 made 60s perfectly round figure. 60 thought 59 was odd. You see, one of his favourite films was 101 Dalmatians. She preferred the sequel. He romanticised his idea that they were star-crossed lovers. They could overcome the odds and evens because they had each other while she maintained those strip views and was on her by her mother that separate could not be equal. And though at the time he felt stupid and dumb for trying to love a girl controlled by her stupid mum, she should have been comforted by that simple Santa 59 away from 60 and you're left with the one. And sure enough, after two months of moping around, 61 days later, 61 was who he found. He had lost his keys and his parents were out. So one day after school, he went right to her house as he's noticed the slightly wonky numbers on the door. He wondered why he never introduced himself before. She let him in, his jaw dropped in awe. 61 was like 60 with a little bit more. So she had prettier eyes and an approachable smile. And like him, rough around the edges, casual style. And like him, everything was organised, pars. And like him, but her friend stayed a while because she was like him. And he liked her. He reckoned she might like him if she knew he was like her. And it was different this time. I mean, this girl was wicked. So he plucked up the coverage and asked for her digits. She said, I'm 61. He grinned. I said, I'm 59. And today I've had a really nice time. So tomorrow, if you wanted, you could come up to mine. She said, sure. She loved talking to someone just as quirky. So she agreed to this unofficial first date. In the end, he was only ready one minute early, but that didn't matter because she arrived one minute later. From that moment on, there was nonstop chatter. And they loved X Factor. How they had two factors. How that did not matter. Distinctiveness made them better. By the end of the 90s, they were met together on one day, she was talking about stuck up 60. She noticed that 59 looked a bit shifty. He blushed and told her of his crush the best thing that never happened because it led to us and 61 was clever see not prone to jealousy she looked him in the eyes and she told him quite tenderly you're 59 i'm 61 together we combined to become twice what 60 could ever be and at this point 59 had tears in his eyes he was so glad to have this one of a kind and in his life he told her the very definition of being prime one in himself could his heart divide and she was the one he wanted to give his heart to she said she felt the same and now she knew the films were half true because that was not real love. That love was just a sample. When it came to real love, they were a prime example. Thank you.
by doing a show all around poetry and maths, I started to appreciate that there was a lot that they did have in common. Uh, and one of the things for me that I think brings them together is this idea of patterns and connections, of looking around at the world and trying to notice things, trying to make sense of it, trying to slot it into place, whether that is with numbers or with words. Uh, and I think in order to do that, you have to let yourself be playful. You have to try and figure stuff out. You have to make mistakes, but only by playing do we allow ourselves to experiment and maybe discover something new. And so this next poem came from that sense of playfulness. I wanted to play around with alliteration again, but rather than just sticking with one sound, like in Paper People, I wanted to try and go through the whole alphabet and pick a different thing for each letter. And then when I started writing it, I realised that at the same time, maybe I could also try and sort of map the history of the universe, uh, just to keep it light. And so this poem is called An A to Z of Time and Space. And I need to put in a disclaimer that given that I could have chosen anything in the entire universe, the thing that I went for for the letter P is a pepper army. Uh, and I know people are tuned in from all over, so I don't know if everyone's familiar with the pepper army, but it's sort of like a dried meat stick. <laughs> um, and I was looking at the ingredients and I was surprised by the percentage of pork in it. Uh, I thought there might be a lot because that's pretty much what it is. But the percentage of pork in this pepperoni was 108%. For every 100 grams of finished product, 108 grams of meat had gone into it. It had lost weight during the process. And I think as a mathematician, that's clearly a flawed way of measuring percentage. As a vegetarian, it's very worrying. But as a poet, I think it's a wonderful metaphor. They say that you should try and give 110% and it turns out pepperoni have come the closest. So because of that, it's made it into the poem. This is an A to Z of time and space. First, there was nothing. I'm talking nothing but nothing. Then there was something. In amongst that, nothing was something. And some things, some are split into some things and some things even managed to become things. To take Adam. Adam was added up out of atoms. Before that, it was black and barren. Then it became big and banging out of the chaos. Can count as crazy complex patterns. And then dun, 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 dinosaurs happened. Through evolution, everything's edited every day. And so we fine tune finesse and then finally find our way. Just as the galaxies have gotten to gear, the game changed because hip, hip, hooray, homo sapiens game. And we invent imagine inspire and innovate we've journeyed from jamming in caves to jamming jam in a cake that knack for knowledge knitted and knotted away like silent caves we learn the language of living often a little late we make music we maneuver mathematical methods we've noticed and noted the nodes of our own neural networks overflowing outpouring open mics to operatics we are the pork presented purported in pepperami packets because we question from quick quizzes to quantum quarks Revolutions of the heart to renaissances of art, you see, scriptures and science seek signs of the sublime. We are through trees, trick us the entirety of time. Our universe is unfinished but utterly underway. Its vibrancy vibrates via ventricles, valves, and veins. You see, we wonder and we wonder. We explore and we explain. We yearn for what is yonder as we zoom out into space. We can forget that we were not the first to be here. By any stretch, we will not be the last to leave. And whilst we can't control our history or know our distant future, we can make the most of what might lie between. We can be kind and we can accept the kindness of others. The world shows us what we allow ourselves the time to discover we can listen, truly listen to another person's needs. We we'll just wait until they've stopped talking to take our turn to speak. We can be brave enough to try and make all kinds of mistakes. We can be playful because what is a life without play? We can remind ourselves each day it's not too late for new beginnings when a single moment cannot the whole universe within it. So when we zoom out, we realise how small it becomes. So either none of it matters or all of it does. From atoms, big bang, chaos, dinosaurs, evolution, the fine tuning of the galaxies to humans. Imagine that journey of knowledge through language and music notes overflow with the poetry of quantum revolution. As a sublime trickles through the universe's veins, we wonder, explore, yearn and zoom out once again. So when we zoom out, we realise how small it becomes. So either none of this matters, or all of it does. Thank you. Thank 
you so much. This next poem I finished writing on the 16th of March 2020. And it's for an event around poetry and climate change in Bristol in the UK. And for me, thinking about climate change, it was quite difficult to know where to begin. I think it's such a massive thing, it can feel overwhelming. So I wanted to take inspiration from the world around us, from this incredible planet we live on, and things like the bumblebee that flies, even though we said it shouldn't be able to, or things like pandas who I think are ridiculous but but they still managed to hang on in there uh, and so I made this poem all about the amazing things in this world and how we shouldn't give up on the world because it's not given up on us um, and then the day that I was due to perform it for the first time it was announced that we were going to go into lockdown in the UK uh, and so I wasn't able to perform it on a stage in the way that I'd intended for a long time um, but it turns out having a poem about trying to hang on and not give up in the face of a massive existential crisis uh, really came into its own. Uh, and the poem is called Impossible. And as a mathematician, I think there's a very clear definition of what impossible is. But as a poet, I think it's a bit more of a gray area. And for me, that's where the fun is. So the poem goes like this. I'm finding it too easy to tell myself things are too hard when facing the end that it's too late to even make a start. But if we take impossible to mean that we don't have a chance, we have lost sight of how unlikely it was we would get this far. The way the single fish outwits the shark by sticking with its school, the way the crescent moon outspins its dark to once again be full, even winter given long enough, begins to lose its call, that which was once exceptional, and her belly registers at all. Flamingos and giraffes look at the word drawn by a child. We can't begin to comprehend all of the ways this world is wild. None of them asked if they were possible before they came to be. None of them have ceased to exist by being told they're make-believe. The bug who finds it all too much and tries to shut off everything to have recovered and then summoned up the strength to stretch its wings, the snake so full of itself. I cannot help but shed its skin. How oh, instead of death, the hedgehog went to bed and slept till spring. To think the earth exists at this specific distance from the sun, down to the angle of the axis on which everything is spun, the fact that trees happen to breathe, that which we need inside our lungs, would all seem impossible. But it had already been done. We are impossible to everyone who's ever gone before. And everyone who's yet to come will push impossible some more, just as indeed the do's we did outdo the don'ts we didn't. So everything's impossible until it isn't. The thought of rivers changing course before somebody gave it down, or that the tide might turn from shore before a line's drawn in the sand. We cannot know how far our actions go, the impact they might have. Sometimes the only thing that we can do is to do what we can. Just as the night is at its darkest when it's introduced today, just as the dry is at its harshest in the breath before it rains. It's easy enough to believe in something when it's all OK, but it's when times are at their hardest that it's hardest to have faith. Yet when the light begins to fade, that's when we need it the most. It's by surviving day to day that we see seasons evolve. If there was never any doubt, there'd be no reason for hope. It could be too late to do anything. She was hell as if we don't. And I am tired of that doom and gloom and self-fulfilling prophecy. I am trying to find room to bloom and self-fulfill the opposite. When it's an act of revolution to try to stay remotely positive, there's nothing wishy-washy about opting to be optimists. Whether a brighter future is possible, we may not truly know, but the first step towards that future is imagining it so. So as indeed the do's we did outdo the don'ts we didn't. So it remains impossible until it isn't. And when it's over, and when no more than old bones within the ground, still the soil knows to sow its seeds from what is broken down. What is lost is always lost until the moment it is found in these things only ever go one way, unless we turn them around. We are so constantly surrounded that it's easy to forget. This world was built upon impossible that has not stopped us yet. So yes, indeed, the do's we did outdo the don'ts we didn't. It only stays impossible until it isn't. Thank you very much. Um, there is a phrase in that poem, uh, which is when this is over, which is a phrase I found myself using a lot 
the last couple of years because suddenly overnight I couldn't do the thing that I love in the same way and I think it was incredible the way that we did come together the way that we stayed connected uh, but I wrote this poem quite early on in that time about missing being able to physically hug people uh, and, and I'm so pleased to be in a in a space where we, we can do that again. Uh, and I think this is kind of the best of it, where we're able to stay connected uh, internationally as well. Um, so this poem came from, from a place of just missing being able to physically hug people. But I think in a broader sense, it was missing that sense of connection. Uh, so to be able to do things like this is, is such a joy. Um, and the poem goes like this. When this is over, I will hold you closer than you've ever known. When you see me, you can squeeze me till you feel my very bones. How I long to let you know that I won't want to let you go. There will be so much left to say. Yet still some things are better shown. I will wrap my arms around you for the seconds we have lost. Our words will find a way to wait as we locate the weight of us that we are changed. There stays a sense of same about the way we touch, though it is strange. We will embrace how long it takes us to adjust. The word of everything we knew is somewhere we cannot return. The word of everything that's new is one we'll build from what we've learned. We never know ashes could rise again until we'd seen them burn. And the next time I'm stood in front of you, we'll feel like it's been earned. Because when the start has given way, it's only then the end can enter. When the heart is given space, it will forever tend to tender these affections kept at bay can once again descend to center something will have come to yearn as hummingbirds connect to nectar. For all those overwhelming moments where I felt like giving up, there is no point where I was worried we'd forgotten how to love. And when the future's all we've got, well then that's got to be enough, all that I know is when I'm low that I have wanted to be hugged. And if you'd rather have a handshake, that's absolutely fine. Even away from me is saying, I am glad that you're alive. Whichever form it takes, when this has passed and we've started again, I will no longer take for granted any chances to connect. Thanks very much. Um, so I am I am so grateful for, for these chances to connect and, and where I am to be able to be performing on stages again. Um, and so I'd just love to to share two more poems with you. Uh, and this next poem for me is is just a celebration of, of being able to do what I do. It's one of my favourite poems that I've written. Uh, and it's also, it feels like a, a happy poem to go to because whenever I'm performing or travelling or if I don't know who I'm going to be in front of, uh, I always go for this poem because I think it's a love poem we can all get behind love but also I wanted it to be cool so I put dinosaurs in it uh, and I think that wherever you are we can all agree that dinosaurs are really cool um, so this poem is called dinosaur love and it goes like this I want to say I love you but it seems it's not enough because when people say I love you it can mean a lot of stuff like I'll always have your back or I'm glad I'm not alone or to be honest, I'd say anything. So you'll hang up the phone because I'm kind of the middle of something right now. And these Doctor Who box sets ain't going to watch themselves. I want to say I love you, but it seems it's not enough because when people say I love you, it can mean a lot of stuff. And what I'm really trying to say is. to love you like a t-rex with a tiny brain but a massive heart and if i was a t-rex i could hold you in those t-rex arms in from my heart because that's dinosaur love it's the way that you send spines down my spine like a stegosaurus or how just like dinosaurs no one cares what came before us because i got that love so big it cannot be ignored like if you're with a dinosaur Everything else seems secondary. Dinosaurs are not mythical creatures. They are legendary. Plus, they're just really cool. I mean, the thing with dinosaurs is dinosaurs are kind of awesome. One of they actually existed. Just my love is real. I ain't talking blindly walking swings attached like Theseus. That's minotaur love. When this is dinosaur love, this ain't no damsel in distress. Trap princess, dragon slaying quest. Because one, dragons never happens. Two, most women don't need rescuing. Sort of feminist dinosaurs. 
This is less prancing unicorns, more two ton triceratops or terrifying pterodactyls tearing terror from above its dinosaur love. Molten rocking meteoric, trust me, got love so old school, it's prehistoric. So if you're into Spielberg or hip hop with a classic vibe, then we could watch Jurassic Park or listen to Jurassic Five. And if you like a bone, then I know a place so we could see him. I'm a lifetime member of the Natural History Museum. I want to say I love you, but that might be awkward. So instead, I'm happy to let that stay in my head where it could not go wrong. And if, as time goes on, my dino love dies out, as you'd expect when it's extinct, rather that we remain friends than became exes. But if, somehow, against the odds, my dino love proves so colossal that it stands the test of time, perfectly preserved like a fossil, then one day, when you've been left in ruins, I need someone to help excavate through them. It won't take an archaeological expert to point you towards me. Now, at that point, I will point out, you're like a Brachiosaurus. So there's no one above you. Then I'll be able to look you in the eyes and say, dinosaur war thingy how did you do that in real life it was so amazing um it comes out a bit differently every time but it's lots of practice by myself being a dinosaur it sounded like a kettle <laughs> <laughs> i would take that um i recommend trying your own dinosaur noises and seeing how you go um thank you so so much for for having me i've got one more poem i'd love to finish on this poem is called unashamed um and it is also the name of my new book of poems i've got out um so if you've enjoyed any of these or want to read it in your own time um please do look that up uh and and i wrote this poem uh for a few reasons one was uh i was speaking to a friend of mine who had had a similar experience to me in that when lockdown happened his world had shrunk in quite a big way and he felt like he had shrunk with it and so i wanted to write this for him but also for myself because i used to think a lot about fitting in and what that meant and, and these days i'm much more excited about filling out and about being the best versions of ourselves that we can be and for me i think the way to do that is to uh build each other up and lift each other up. And if you can be in that kind of community that is that is supportive of you, I think it makes all the difference in the world. Um, and so I wrote this for my friend, but also for anyone who feels like they've shrunk in any kind of way or who needs to get themselves back. Um, because I think it, it takes a lot to remind ourselves how amazing we can be. Um, so this poem is called Unashamed and it goes like this. It's not your job to make sure others feel more comfortable. You need not dull your glow in the hope they might see. You need not water down your core to be more palatable. May you be the you that you need you to be, unashamed. We cannot help how others see us, though we may well try our hardest. How we see ourselves can free ourselves to be ourselves regardless. Home is where you can be open hearted. Whether trapped or trapeze artist all comes down to how we're harnessed. I'm trying to free my roots like playing past the parcel packed with parsnips when the music stops and no one's watching will you keep on dancing let us decorate and garnish any reputations tarnish because despite it all i still fancy our chances let us not file away our edges in an effort to be smooth when the records show the denser how we get into that groove all that energy invested in the editing of you i hope one day you'll let it loose and let me be there when you do because in the moment when your guard slipped for a second or two, I could have sworn I caught a glimpse and I saw heaven in you, unashamed. The time I'll celebrate you losing weight is shedding expectation. Unless your senator or garner there's no point adopting layers when the heart of you is the part of you that's blazing. And others may have tried to hide your light. You may have joined in this yourself. But joy of joys, the joy of joys, it shall not be overwhelmed. You could be static or your static could cause lightning storms. Whether it's lions or it's iron or your core contains all types of raw, that friction that you feel that's an igniting force. So light the torch, if we can't see it in ourselves, then what is brightness for? We do those closest to us a disservice. If we only ever let them see the small of us. If we can open up enough to let them get beneath the surface, there's so much more to love. If we can show them all of us, the flaws in us, the force of us. 
the full on awe of us. The rise and fall of us, the wise and fallen us, yes, all of us, the fine and coarse of us. The fine prints in the claws of us, the fire imprinted in our blood cells as they course in us, it's all in us. That morning that seems daunting till it dawns on us that there is more adored in us than simply what's adorning us. So call it what you want, there's something calling us. And I've caught enough of you to know that you're enough. Any boxes they may try and stop you with, instead of building up a fort, let's make a rocket ship. Treat them as photos, not negatives developed into positives, but nothing more than the simplest of shots of things, because all the best bits of your story are still yet to be unfurled. You are the caterpillar that becomes the butterfly that flaps its wings and causes an earthquake halfway around the world. You are amazing. And if they try to rain on your parade, let it remind you how much fun it is to party while it's raining. May you take up space and stay there unashamed. Thank you so much. Um, Thank Harry, you. that's just brilliant. Um, I've had teachers texting me while you've been on. Um, and the thing about your poetry is it's so moving. And, um, you know, it's hard for me. I've got to stand here. Not, I'm not allowed to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they've all been going, oh, you know, really <laughs> superb. Um, and that's what poetry does, doesn't it? Um, thank you so much. So, guys. Um, what what questions do you have for for Harry? Just the most amazing poet I've I've ever met, actually. All oh, hands are going up. So we've got Hafsa. Um, I have this question: Is there anything that rhymes with like with orange? Uh, it's a good question. I am a massive fan of a half rhyme and of trying to force words together, even when they maybe don't quite fit. So I think there's not so much a perfect rhyme for it but i would rhyme it with something like syringe or lozenge or even porridge so i think when people tell me that you can't do something that feels like a challenge to try and somehow make it work brilliant um sergey um what is your biggest struggle as a poet it's a good question i think when I started writing, it was always a, a fun thing to do on the site. So there was no pressure at all. And then it's become my main thing. And so I think what feels like a struggle is, I think the last two years were, were really difficult because I was so disconnected from people. So it was really hard to know if my words were reaching people or having any kind of impact. And it was, it was a really isolating time. So I think in times like that, part of the struggle is believing in what you're doing and and keeping going even when you're not really getting any signs from other people or the universe that it's, it's making a difference so, so I really love getting to share my poems and, and see people's faces because I think then it feels more obvious that the people are connecting with it uh, so I think the struggle is trying to remember that that what you do is is worthwhile and that you can't always tell how it affects people but it's still worth writing and sharing even if you don't know where it's going to go Brilliant. Um, Daniel, you have a question. Wow, that that was just amazing on how you rapped, really. It, all the raps are positive messages. I mean, you've made me inspired, maybe think up one of my own based on last year. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I, I encourage you to, to try and write your own. I think it's such a fun thing to do, and I think it helps you to process what you've been going through. So writing one about the last year sounds like an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. That was so lovely to hear. Um, Jamie? Do you ever get a case of writer's block and not be able to finish a poem? Yes, good question. Uh, definitely. I, I used to just work on one poem at the time in my spare time. And whenever I had a moment, I would go and work on it. It'd be really exciting. But now, um, I'll always have a few different things on the go. So if I'm stuck on one particular poem, I will try and move on to a different one. Uh, but also if I'm ever stuck, I find uh, I find other people really inspiring. So whether it is listening to music or watching someone perform live or even seeing a good film, I think there's so much out there that can inspire us. So if I'm ever stuck, I will try and be inspired by someone else or even going for a walk or riding my bike. 
will kind of help you to to jog that. Um, and also, I think it's just trusting that that the words will come. And and sometimes it feels really difficult, and sometimes it feels really fun. But I think as with playing an instrument or playing a sport, the more you practice, the easier it can get. And you just have to sit with it when it feels difficult because it's always worth it at the other side. But thank you for that question. And and Harrison. Have you ever had any times where you felt like just you just can't go on? You're just so battered up, like you're so defeated that you just can't go on. Uh, it's a good question. I think the the closest I came to that was at the start of this year, after you know eighteen months of not being able to to perform or connect with people in in that way. Uh, and so I did take a break for a few months of just trying to look after myself and make sure that I felt well enough in myself to be able to do that because I think it's such a a pleasure and a joy to be able to do this that I want to be able to do it well and I told myself if it ever stopped being enjoyable then I would rather it go back to being a hobby um so that's the closest that came and I'm really glad I, I didn't give up because I think uh so much has changed since then uh, that it does feel possible again but I think I feel really fortunate that I've got people near me who who support me and who encourage me, even when I'm finding it difficult. So whether that's family or friends, I think if you've got people who can lift you up, it makes all the difference in the world. And um, we've got Zenya. Hello, so I just wanted to ask, do you ever find that your um, more rigid math side kind of clashes with your more creative poetry side when writing poets? It's a really good question. I think at its best, the two help each other. So I think the math side of me is really intricate and detailed. And so with poems like the A to Z one, as soon as I had a structure, I knew what I wanted to do with it. And then once you've got that, I think that's where the poetry side comes in and tries to fit a message in there or make it more of a story. And so I think there are times when I just want it to be as detailed and specific and, and clever as possible and I have to remember that there's got to be space for for the the human side of it as well and the emotional side of it and so I think my hope is that when both come together it can be a little bit of the best of both worlds um, but also I think it, you know we've all got these different sides in us and I think it's important that we we give ourselves permission to to lean into that I used to think that I had to either be one or the other but I think if you can be all of these things, then that is where hopefully you can you can thrive to be be the you that you want to be. Amazing. Um, Adeline. Um, so if you had to summarise the beauty of poetry in one sentence, what would it be? What a question. If I had to summarise the beauty of poetry in one sentence. One of my favourite quotes I think this counts as a sentence is from a poem by Mary Oliver and she simply says instructions for living a life pay attention be astonished and tell about it and for me that is what poetry is it is paying attention to the world around you letting yourself have that sense of wonder and just to find stuff amazing and then sharing that with other people and I think for me, when, when poetry works, it's when it connects with people and it helps them to see the world differently. And I think part of that process has to be being astonished or having wonder and excitement, because I think there is so much in this world that is incredible that it's easy to forget. And so I think if we can remind ourselves and each other of that, that can only be a good thing. But that is an excellent question. Thank you. It really was. Um, the question was moving. Win-win. Um, Okay, so I wanted to ask you what motivates you to go on to poetry, to write poetry and then perform poetry on stage? Really good question. Uh, when I first started writing, I, I was writing lyrics. I used to love listening to music. I wanted to be in a band, so I wrote lyrics to perform with my friends. And then it was only when I realised that I couldn't really play an instrument or sing. Um, <laughs> but I enjoyed the craft of it and and I enjoyed putting the words together and it was when I performed a poem for the first time and I felt it connect with the room 
that I realized that that was when I felt like I came alive almost you know at the time I was thinking about what to study after school and there were all of these different options and, and lots of them felt exciting but it was only when I was writing and performing my poems that I felt like I could put all of myself into it both my sense of humor my nerdy math side my personal philosophies and beliefs it all came together and so I think as soon as I did it it just felt right and it's hard to explain but it made sense to me and so I wanted to give that as much energy as I could um but another really good question thank you thank you I have a question from one of our teachers Mrs Howard hello Mrs Howard <laughs> Oh, I sorry, <laughs> I'm not used to being muted. Yeah, sorry, I haven't got my camera on. I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit moved at the moment, <laughs> but it's, it's really touched me. Um, I was just saying to Mrs. Trafford before, we, my, with my um, level four students, we're looking at rhetorical devices in poetry, and your poems have so many of them in there. Um, are, are you familiar with those, or does it just come naturally? Um, I think, I think it's a mixture. I think often when I write, I don't set out to to do one specific thing or, or you know sometimes there is a lot of alliteration or things like that but I think it's then when it is so ingrained that it, that it comes out and and I love language and I love what's possible and I think even when you're talking about something really serious I think you can be playful with your words and, and be joyful with your words so I try and push that to its limit and use it as much as possible whether that is consciously or subconsciously I think it is such a, a joy to use words in that way so I hope that comes across it certainly does <laughs> they bounce along yeah they really bounce along anyway we're both English teachers so we both yeah <laughs> really enjoyed this so much and um, Asha has a question um what's the best piece of advice that you can give and that you live by Oh, another fantastic question. Um, oh, it's hard to know. They're, one of my favourite writers is a writer called Kay Tempest, and they started off doing music and hip hop, and they've now written novels and plays, and they're just fantastic. And I managed to get permission from them to put a quote of theirs in the front of my book. And it's a, a lyric from one of their earlier songs, and it just says, why do something if you can't be proud of it and I love that as a challenge and as a question because I think whether it is your day-to-day -day life or something bigger uh you know I think it's such an important thing to think about and so now I try and both in my writing but also in the way that I go about my day-to-day -day, I try and live in a way that I can be proud of and so I think my my advice to my younger self would be to remember that and, and whether or not you think something matters or is massive in the big scale of things I think to try and do it in a way that you can look back on and, and, and feel good about is is a good way to try and guide it so I might answer that question differently in a minute's time but at the moment that's what comes to mind. Um, can I ask you a question it's so kind of two in one but being a poet it seems to me like quite an alternative way of life and um, I'm wondering if you think there's a particular type of person drawn to this who's got the bravery to do that because it's brave um, and how it went down at home. I'm going to be a poet. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think of the of the other people I know who are poets, I think a common theme is almost like it doesn't feel like a choice that like you have this inside you and, and you want to share this thing with the world and and it and it doesn't make sense and, and and it doesn't fit with a lot of things but you've got to give it a go anyway and so a few poets know had a similar thing where they never intended to be a poet but they wanted to write and they wanted to share it and one thing led to another and so I felt really fortunate in that one I started doing it when I was studying maths. So I had three or four years where I had that structure and this was just a fun thing on the side. So that meant that when I did finish studying and, and thought about, I'm gonna be a poet, 
I already had a background of having done it for a few years and, and built that up. And, and also I felt so fortunate that when I told my mum and dad that I thought that's what I wanted to do, they understood and they could see how much it meant to me and they said that they would you know support me in that and and if it went wrong then I could think about using the maths in a, in a different way but I think I wanted to at least give it a go because I thought to be able to give all of your time to this thing that makes you come alive felt like such a a wonderful thing to to try and do and and thankfully I've, I'm still going and and I've never looked back but I think even if it didn't work out as a job, it would always be a passion. And I think, yeah, sometimes we're, we're told that we have to choose between one or the other. But I think if you can love what you do and, and do it as much as possible, that's that's an amazing way to exist. Yeah, complete. Thank you. The world is a better place because we've got artists taking those risks, really. Um, we're very fortunate. Um, we've got another question from Harrison. We've got about three minutes left. So if you've got a question bubbling away up there, it'd be nice to hear from some of our older students as well. Um, Harrison, what did you want to ask? This is more of a recommendation, but if you can still remember the B thing, uh, puns, you could actually write that into a book and then it, it would really, like, I really found it hilarious. That would make a really good joke book. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will consider that as a backup. I love I love puns and I love jokes. And I think sometimes I try and put them in my poems, but also I think for their own sake, it is it is a fun thing to do. So I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Well, Harry, I don't know if you've ever been put on the spot as much as that at the end of a gig. Um, we seem to have run out of questions. Um, so I don't know. I think all that remains to be said is uh, a very huge thank you. And maybe we could come on on our mic so Harry can hear the well-deserved round of applause that we want to, to give him. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. And um, good luck. Um, show us your book again, because uh, it's going in a few Christmas stockings, I think. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Unashamed. Look at that, kids. It's not even on the same line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you so much. And uh, it's a big, big warm goodbye from us. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye.